That's four, five, six, seven! Hoverboards, they're pretty bad. I mean, they can be fun, but they're bad. Decent, but also really, really terrible. They're like tiny electric cars, except they're worse in every single way. Or are they? I mean, cars like the Tesla are great if you can get it. You see, there's not enough of them to go around. I mean, even if we all could afford them, which we can't, they're currently made with some pretty scarce materials. Plus, the amount of crap that's released into the atmosphere from simply making one is enough to ensure that you aren't doing anything really green until you've driven it for years. And that's where we come back to hoverboards. You see, they've already been made. Too many have already been made. Like any good fad, people couldn't get enough until suddenly, now they can't give them away. I mean, the ones that I bought, I got off of Marketplace for like 30 bucks a pop, and the rest I got from the dump. But they're not garbage, they're the missing link. You see, there's already millions of cars just lying around because their engines don't work. And if we could somehow combine those cars with these hoverboards, we could all hit the Starbucks drive-through with a clean, green conscience. But how do you strap a hoverboard to a car? And it's a toy, won't it be crushed? Can several of them even get it to move? And just how many is it going to take? I mean, you know, that's basically what we're gonna figure out with the video. So, you know, stick around. It'll be fun, I promise. So just how much duct tape does it take to strap a hoverboard to a tire? Well, thankfully, we don't have to find out because my buddy Carrie had some broken automotive dollies on hand. You know, those things that you put under your car tire so that you can push it around the garage. Well, I knew that if I strapped a hoverboard to each end, it just might have a chance of holding the weight of a car. And these dollies were already missing their casters since, well, he grabbed them from the recycling center, just like the hoverboards he gave me. So please leave a comment that says, thanks, Carrie. So this frame is super simple, but figuring out the electronics was not. You see, I wanted to run the hoverboards using their internal circuits, and there's a couple of ways to do that. The first would be to reprogram each control board. That's what I did for my walking desk, where I covered over 100 miles using a knob and thumbstick as the throttle and steering. The first issue is that not all hoverboards have the same types of circuit boards, and unfortunately, most of mine have these weird split boards that are just harder to work with than the single board design like I used on the desk. Plus, programming isn't foolproof, and I just don't have the time to hunt down every random bug on every different board. Jeez Louise. The second way that I considered was to rig up something that just pushes the foot pad sensors. Now, I could theoretically relocate all of these sensors to some sort of a handheld controller, but some of these boards were likely also at the dump specifically because of their sensors. So for the sake of time and consistency, I just bought some cheap control boards that had about the same power output as a hoverboard. And thankfully, all the motors that I then wired them to worked flawlessly. Well, most of them. <laughs> But with a couple of bad cores swap, I was almost ready to throw these under a car. Juggling so many hoverboards and their corresponding variables was a bit overwhelming. Kind of like carrying too many thoughts around in your head. It's incredibly difficult to understand what to do with what you have without a clean level workspace to lay it all out and have a look. Which is why I'm excited that today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp. In my experience, a good therapist gives you exactly that. The space to examine and understand your own thoughts and feelings. And BetterHelp makes the path from you to that therapist so much simpler. Just listen to my brother Charles. I was living in a small town in Alaska where everyone knows everyone. BetterHelp not only made it affordable to find a therapist, but also made it simple and straightforward to find the right one. I feel like BetterHelp is one of the best companies out there because they're making therapy something that everyone can find. Here's some things that BetterHelp does that I like. If the therapist that you're first matched with doesn't feel right, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost. And you have access to a pool of over 30,000 licensed therapists, likely giving you way more options than you could find locally. Plus, your therapy sessions can be a video chat, phone call, even messaging, and at a time that works for you, making the whole process way less intimidating. So if you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com slash joelcreates. Clicking that link helps support this channel. And it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. So you can connect to the therapist, see if it helps you. Thanks, BetterHelp. It was finally time to start strapping hoverboards to Yankel, Quincy's 91 VW Golf. And he loves this car, which is why it's perfect for our half-baked experiments. That, and it also doesn't weigh much, but we are definitely exceeding the max weight limits of these boards. Is the weight off? Oh man. 
It looks so good. Look at it. I mean, that's, that's an electric car now. Now, of course I like it. I built it. But we need the opinion of an expert. So meet Jesse. He used to work for an electric car company. As long as it can reach like five miles an hour, I think we're good. 35, actually. 35. <laughs> so to start chipping away at his objectivity, I had Jesse help wire in the recycled battery. And then it was time. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. We got a turning issue. Ah, it's not turning with the car. <laughs> Somehow, I didn't anticipate this super obvious problem, but Jesse gave us his ratchet straps and was now invested to the point of losing all impartiality as a judge. So it was a win-win. All right, here we go. It was incredible. These eight plastic wheels and cheap metal frames from children's toys were now moving oh this God. actual car and two full-grown passengers. <laughs> Even on gravel. But while the straps were helping, they didn't really fix the turning problem. They went over the bumps really well. The steering wheel is like totally misaligned and it really feels like you're doing the world's slowest Tokyo drift. <laughs> <laughs> but even with incredibly janky steering, the early results were really promising. Well, as long as you didn't look too close. The aluminum itself is bent. But there was no turning back now, literally. I mean, I ran out of time to add reverse. So we manually backed it up for our first top speed test. Oh, hey, I'm Quincy. And this? No. <laughs> I need a spray bottle. <laughs> every time he starts talking about his channel. All right, you ready? Wait, hang on. Full power. <laughs> Steering feels good. Full power. How fast are we going? I don't know. I forgot to get a GPS. We're, we're moving. Not only were we moving, but it was comfy. Because the wheels could pivot on the axle, we technically now had even more suspension than a normal car. That was awesome. It feels so natural while you're moving. Starting is really sketch. But we needed more data than just a feeling. So this time I remembered to turn on my GPS speedometer app. Dude, that's four, five, six, seven. Three. Eight. <laughs> and while it may not have been fast and furious, these runs were taking their toll on some of the hoverboard parts. One of them is really bad, but the other ones are fine. And it was for this reason that our third run was by far the most eventful. I'm six feet tall and I have to run to keep up. It's actually going so fast. Run into the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> The car's okay. Good, okay, good. Oh, no! <laughs> so, yeah, I think I sent her a little too hard there, bud. But the failure had made me stronger and smarter. I had a plan. Wheel dollies were out. I needed a custom frame that would grip the sides of the tire for turning, bring the wheels closer together, and cut out those cheap cast aluminum hoverboard frames completely. I needed two by fours and pipe. And these custom frames were a snap, as in, I almost snapped from the tedium of making them all. This was my cave. I was Tony Stark, facing down my hover demons with nothing but sheer force of will. And Jesse. You can now say you've worked for two electric car companies. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> the pipe holds the hub motor axles. And the tire rests between these two pipes so that most of the car's weight goes directly to the wheels. The two by fours hug the sidewalls of the tire to ensure that it turns with it. This frame is significantly smaller than the previous design, but that much change comes with risk. I mean, what if this wood simply can't handle the strain? And with now 16 wheels, 16 cheap circuit boards, and a couple dozen wire connections per board, there were bound to be electrical issues. And yes, I said 16. Four wheels for every one of Yankel's four wheels. And here's the thing, even if I get all this tedious wiring done in time for the test tomorrow, we might put them on the car and they'll just crack apart. And then I'll have sunk countless hours into getting these things ready just to watch them fail. So I guess that's why you're watching though. So I should probably just shut up and <laughs> deal with it. So here's the eight easy steps to a great final test. Step one, survive the weight drop. What a sound that yeah. is. The rear is good, but then again, it's the lighter half. 
The front is good, at least when it's standing still. Which brings us to step two, bring in a new judge, Tesla owner Graydon. There's 16 hoverboard wheels underneath this car. 16. <laughs> this is the throttle, and here's the brake. It's a can of beans. <laughs> step three, try and give it some power. <laughs> uh, oh! Step four, try and figure out why some of your wheels are going backwards when they definitely didn't do that during their benchtop test. Why didn't it work? Maybe the answer will reveal itself if I finish this Taco Bell. <laughs> Step five, grapple with nature. Just found out that it's gonna rain in like an hour and we've been doing this for like three or four hours. Yeah. And the car just exploded. Well, your hoverboard is misfiring. <laughs> Step six, get all motors working but one. Step seven, gain favor with your second judge through pity. I don't think Joel knows what he's doing. He always knows what he's doing. And step eight, accept 93.75% success. 15 wheel drive, baby. <laughs> it's working. It's working. And this part can only be described as a dream. Oh, things got pickup. Oh gosh. Oh. Looking back, I'm still a bit speechless. Even the way that the car moved down the road looked totally surreal. And after everything I'd put into this, it, it felt good. But then I had to wake up. Something broke. Did something break? Yeah, something popped. Yeah, I heard it. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of what failed and why, because there were honestly just too many variables to be completely sure, though I'm sure the higher voltage that I chose for this test probably didn't help. And though I later tried to salvage enough motor controllers to just run the rear wheels again, the damage was just too extensive, and there was only one rational thing left to do. What kind of range you get in this thing? 270. Oh. But it's four and a half years, like four years old. Yeah, that's not bad. We made it 100 feet. <laughs> <laughs>